And um and welcome to this evening. Um, thanks Jane Belfridge for that music and Michelle for the photos. Um, so please bear with us tonight. We've had several of our um, panelists lose power and um, the person who was meant to be emceeing unfortunately is unavailable um, due to a power outage. So I have jumped in at the last minute Thank you very much for um, being patient with us. There may be some slight technical difficulties. We're just going to see how we go. Um, so let me just get sorted here. Um, first of all, thanks everyone for coming. It's fantastic to see so many faces. And um, tonight we have clo live closed captioning. Um, so thank you so much, Sula. Um, you can enable this at the bottom of your screen um, if that's helpful for you. Wonderful. So I'm Claudia, Claudia Galwa, and I'm the coordinator of the Sustainable Cities campaign at Friends of the Earth. So firstly, just a bit of housekeeping. It would be great if everyone could keep their microphones muted to reduce background noise. And this event will also be live streamed to Facebook and we are making a recording as well. So if you don't want other participants to see you, if that's okay, you can turn off your video. Um, wonderful. So before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the land on which we meet today. Most of us are tuning in for, from somewhere in Victoria, which means we're on stolen land. And I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to Indigenous folks who might be here today. Sovereignty has never been ceded. And as we work to fight for climate justice, we must continue to elevate the voices of Indigenous people. A really good way to support Indigenous folks is to pay the rent. You can do this by making a monthly donation to your favourite Indigenous organisation or at paytherent.net.au. So today I'm calling in from the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I'm in Brunswick. And it's really good to keep in mind that whenever we're talking about issues that affect land in our society, we need to be involving First Nations communities. So tonight we're going to be hearing from six speakers about the North East Link Toll Road, which is set to cut through um, communities and bulldoze over 26,000 trees. It's going to be up to 24 lanes, an LA style mega road, and it's set to lock Melbourne into a future of car dependency, especially in an area that 
pub where public transport is really lacking and really needed. So first of all, we'll hear from the six panelists and then we'll have time for questions afterwards. So please feel free to post your questions in the chat box as they come to mind. And for those of you following along on Facebook Live, you can also ask questions by commenting on the live stream. So just a quick little bit about um, Sustainable Cities. Tonight's event is um, co-hosted um, by Sustainable Cities and Friends of Banyul, and we'll hear a bit more about Friends of Banyul afterwards. Um, but Sustainable Cities is a grassroots campaign run through Friends of the Earth and supported by the Public Transport Users Association. So we're working with locals to stop destructive toll roads like this one, the Northeast Link, and to direct government spending towards sustainable well, public well. transport options. Oh, sounds like there's um, some people who aren't muted. If you could keep your microphone muted, that would be fantastic. Thank you. So this includes more buses, trams and trains, as well as active transport infrastructure, like better bike paths and footpaths. And as we know, transport is a social justice and environmental issue. And without it, many people are left isolated and don't have the opportunity to participate in all that we, all that Victoria has to offer. Transport is also the second largest and fastest growing contributor to emissions in Victoria. So if we wanna rein in emissions, we really need to make sure that we're moving towards sustainable transport. So, um, without further ado, I will introduce our first speaker for this evening. Um, Michelle is the current president of Friends of Banyul, a local advocacy group opposed to the Northeast Link. And for the, for the last three years, she has been a community representative on the Northeast Link Community Liaison Group. She's also a member of Banyul City Council's <coughs> Environmental Advisory Group. Um, and um, Michelle has experience in environmental risk assessment, management, and auditioning. <laughs> Marie Ainsley, maybe um, Nat, if you could remove Marie Ainsley from the <laughs> meeting, that would be great. Thank you. Um, so um, for the last four years, Michelle has been trying to raise awareness about the Northeast Link project's um, terrible impacts and failings. So I am going to share Michelle's um, slides and I'll pass it over to you, Michelle. Hello, Claudia. Now, can everybody hear me? You might need to yell a little bit louder. Hi, can everybody hear me? Any, oh, fantastic. I've, um, I'm one of these lucky people who has lost power and um, I'm learning about the technology, so please bear with me. Um, I'd like to say that I'm on Wurundjeri Woiwurrung land and I'm paying respects to the elders that are past, present and emerging and particularly to any uh, elders that are present tonight. <laughs> And I'm hoping for divine intervention that this thing actually works. Anyway, Claudia, if you wouldn't mind sharing your screen and I'll, um, I'll go to my PowerPoint. Okay, sure. So some people are saying that they can't hear. Um, so I'll just remind everyone there is closed captioning happening. So if you click at the bottom of your screen, the bottom right hand corner, and you can enable closed captioning. That way, everything that Michelle says um, should be captured as long as Sula can hear. Hopefully, Sula can. Um, okay, I'll, I'll yell as well. Okay, great. Okay, um, okay so if you could um, share the screen, I'll go to the first slide. Yeah. So, um, and it's, uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the Northeast Link project, a little bit of the history uh, and the size, talk a little bit about the risk assessment and the um, what it's like being a NELP community liaison member and what's happening now. So if you could go to the ne next slide, thanks Claudia. Now this is um, a map that uh, the community were provided with in 2017 
and the idea was that option A was the shortest, least expensive option with the least environmental damage and nothing could be further from the truth. It, it fails to mention the 18 kilometres of Eastern Freeway doubling and trebling. And we also, um, it fails to uh, take into account the terrible damage to the Simpson Army Barracks. That land was never assessed and it was just taken as uh, Commonwealth land that we could destroy. So if we had the next slide, thanks Claudia. Now this is um, a map that shows uh, a little bit better what the project is about the, um, it includes extensive works on the M80, and it, which is the Metropolitan Ring Road, extensive works on the Eastern Freeway and major interchanges. And you can see the um, surface road works, trench and tunnel that would uh, that will divide Banyul in half and would be adjoining to properties. Can I have the next slide? Thanks, Claudia. Can I have the, yeah, thank you. The next slide, please, Claudia. Yeah, this is... Um, Sorry, my computer just froze. Yeah, I know it looks a little strange, but this is a plan that uh, the North East Link produced once in uh, federal government documents. And um, it just shows the size of the project. It will um, impact 30 suburbs in um, the, uh, the northeast of Melbourne and actually impacts over 700,000 people. And we know this because Northeast Link did mail outs to over 300,000 businesses and homes. And not, and not everyone's going to suffer the same as those living alongside it, but there will be tens of thousands of people along the Eastern Freeway and the works in Banyul. So if you could go to the next slide, thanks Claudia. Now this um, picture is what's happening now. The early works have started. This is a complementary project in the um, Greensboro College and it involves, um, could you go back one, back to the, back to the, um, yeah, th thanks Claudia. Now that in, that's stripping of soil to make synthetic and to, you know, to, to create a nice turf, so no, synthetic soccer field and a new football oval and a new pavilion. And what's happened is the, uh, with the runoff, and the poor management with the recent rain, we have had a, our own yellow brick road produced in the local waterway, which is the Beatrix Street drain. And that flows into the Plenty River and then to the Yarra River. Now this is only a tiny fraction of the project. If you can imagine this about a thousand times more, we're looking at the, uh, the Yarra will be running yellow. Now it's already muddy, but it will be permanently running yellow with the impacts of the Northeast Link. And if we go to the next slide, and that this shows what um, the Northeast, or this is a presentation of what the, um, oh dear, this, um, this shows that Northeast Link assessed this as being low risk and manageable, but they can't manage anything. They, they have not supervised the contractors. They don't care, and neither does the EPA. Complaints have been made. No one has attended. No one solved this problem, and we still have runoff from that project occurring now. So if I can have the next slide, please. And this is um, in the yellow on the left-hand side in Yulambi. That's um, where the tunnel boring machine is going to be launched from. It is alongside homes, alongside schools, alongside kindergartens, alongside residential aged care homes. And it involves the removal of thousands of trees and massive earthworks 
for seven years so that the people nearby, school children, kindergarten children, the elderly, and our most which are our most vulnerable and sensitive receptors are going to be exposed to air pollution and noise pollution for seven years while this project occurs. And this was sprung on us. We didn't know this was going to happen until the environmental effects statement hearing was almost over. So if I can have the next slide, Claudia. Now, this is some of the land and some of the trees in the Simpson Army barracks that are going to be destroyed. So this is a magnificent, on the left, we've got a magnificent scribbly gum, which is about 20 metres high. And we have um, endangered woodland forest in the Simpson Army barracks that is thriving. And that, um, and all this land will be, um, all 13 hectares will be a wasteland and it's home to um, some rare vegetation, which um, James Dean will talk about further. So if you can have the next slide, thanks Claudia. Uh, this is what's happening now on the ground. Uh, the beautiful trees on the left have been removed. Uh, all the trees on the photo on the right hand side will be removed. And we already have displaced animals. We already have um, kookaburras looking for homes, magpies are displaced and rosellas. And so it's, it's already having a significant impact on wildlife. So we can have the next slide, thanks Claudia. And this is what we all are frightened of. This is a photo of the Mullum Mullum Tunnel construction. And we we are facing a worse situation in Yulambi and a worse situation in Greensboro, Watsonia, and all along the Eastern Freeway at the major intersections. And I um, I've been campaigning hard on this for the last four years. I've been part of the community liaison group. And I have to say, NELP do fail to provide information. They refuse to provide information. And it's the, it's, um, we have the CLG, it's just a tick the box exercise for them. They do not listen to concerns. They do not respond to concerns. And because of that, I have um, decided to announce my candidacy in the annual local government elections that are coming up. And I will be standing in the seat of, or in the ward of Sherborne. And that's because I want to get a seat at the table. Apparently, um, the council was being offered a seat at the table in, in the design of the project. And I want to be part of that process and I want to continue to be an advocate for the community. And I might leave it there, um, Claudia. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Michelle. It's been really wonderful working with Michelle over the past year or so. She's just got such a wealth of knowledge on this topic and has had first hand um, experience with the project, as well as being such an integral person in the community and such a strong advocate. So thank you so much for your insights, Michelle. And I will now pass it on to the next speaker who is on my list somewhere. One, one moment, bear with me. Um, Michelle, um, oh, the next person is Katie. Wonderful. Um, so I do have a, an introduction for Katie, but it has disappeared. So maybe Katie, I'll just get you to introduce yourself. I know Katie personally, and I know she's a staunch activist in her area and that she works with Friends of Banyul as well. But maybe I'll hand it over to you, Katie, to introduce yourself a bit better. And um, thank you, take it away. Sure, thank you very much, Claudia, and thanks um, 
everybody for giving me the opportunity to speak this evening. Um, I'm Katie George, as you've heard. I'm actually um, a resident of Yulambi and our family home abuts the Northeast Link uh, project boundary. And we currently have um, a fantastic view of the early works that are going on at the bottom of my driveway. Um, we're so close that I can just about hear all of the conversations that are going on with the workers uh, as they're cutting down all of the trees. They've got the chippers going um, most of the day at the moment. We're going to be facing road sores next week as they chop up our street and we can't have vehicle access to our homes for the coming months. Um, and night works are going along on uh, Greensboro Road to relocate services at the moment. So it equates to about 22 hours of noisy works in a 24 hour period. Um, if that gives you a bit of an illustration of what we're dealing with at the moment. Um, just a little bit about um, my family. I've got three young children uh, who are all um, primary school and kinder age. Uh, and my husband, we're at home under stage four restrictions like everybody else at the moment. So there's absolutely no respite from the impacts of this, um, the, the early works that are going on at the moment for us. Um, and I just wanted to probably give a bit of an overview of our journey from um, 2017, from when we were fortunate enough to buy our first home uh, to where we are at now, if you'll indulge me a moment. Um, so in 2017, um, we had been house hunting um, for approximately two years. And we were looking specifically to buy into this area because I've lived in Banyul um, my entire life. I think it's a fantastic place to raise a family. Um, all of my family also live in Banyul, so it's close to relatives. Um, and we were looking specifically to buy into this area because of the schools and the quality of the, the public schools in the area. Um, we found our current home that was on the market, it was still a frame under construction. Um, it was a townhouse and we thought, oh, we weren't sure that a townhouse was really suitable for us uh, with a family of three kids um, because we wanted a bit more space, but it was a new build and it was adjacent to a wonderful reserve that provided the open space of a backyard um, as, a, as a quasi arrangement from uh, being able to have our own adjoining the house. So. Um, we contacted Northeast Link um, following the announcement of uh, Corridor A being selected to find out how the property would be impacted before settlement. And I was lied to um, quite ex explicitly by the landowner team in Northeast Link to the point that they had told me that we were not going to be impacted at all. Uh, all of the works would be further north than we are. Um, the tunnel was going to start further north than we are, so everything would be underground by the time it came to us. Um, that the environmental performance requirements now for major projects were so stringent that they couldn't just barrel drains and creeks anymore, um, that they had to make sure that trees were retained. And um, the person that I spoke to even went as far as dispar making disparaging remarks about activists in the Manningham area that were frightening all of the people around there um, over the proposed impacts of the project and that um, they were exaggerating and frightening the elderly, which was a bit of a, a flag for me in hindsight. Um, but anyway, we proceeded with settlement and the announcement went through that we were getting uh, a lower plenty road interchange that was going to take our reserve. Um, so I started asking the what's all this then questions of North East Link uh, in and around March of last year. And um, after finding out that we were going to not only lose the reserve, we then found out through the environment, environment effect statement process that um, we were going to have a tunnel boring machine at the bottom of our driveway around about, um, I think it was very late August last year. And that had been um, hidden from us from March. They knew, they knew about that when I had started talking to them about it in March and they had hidden that. Um, then uh, following the EES process, we were really encouraged to see that the EES panel supported um, the overwhelming community push for a longer, a longer board tunnel through Banyul to try and save 
um, a lot of the environment and the residents from the heartache of the construction of this project. Um, and unfortunately, the Minister for Planning decided to ignore those recommendations largely. Um, so now we're in a, a situation of trying to raise community awareness about what the impacts of the project are actually going to be. Um, there are many people in my immediate vicinity who still don't actually know much about North East Link, irrespective of all of the advertising that they've done. Um, there are many people who think that it's going to be the best project since sliced bread um, and it's what we need. Um, there are many people who think that if you're impacted by noise and you're impacted to the point that it's so bad that you might not be able to live in your home anymore, that you will be fairly compensated. Um, and I think that those are all fairly reasonable um, and predictable views that people would have. Um, but I'm here to tell you in my experience that that's just not the case. Um, we've had uh, an, a few um, disputes, I would say, with the contractors over the last week um, because of the noise impacts in my home. We have said that um, we we're assured that they were going to meet their environmental performance requirements and that the noise wouldn't be so bad and that we would be able to continue to live in our home. Um, and that's just not the reality. We've requested um, measures to try and get the noise to be moved further away from us with the equipment being moved further and uh, further away. Um, we've been ignored with those requests. Um, we've asked for um, results of testing um, when there have been works and we've had concerns that it's been uh, works to do with asbestos contaminated soil and we've had the results of the testing withheld. Um, we're told that there's an independent environmental auditor that's supposed to look after all of these things on behalf of community and that they largely the, the contractors and NELP are not answerable to us. So that's kind of where we're at. Um, I think what I would like to do is um, start to really reach out to people in the community to let them know that noise travels a lot further than just the boundary of the project. And um, if you have not yet received a notification from North East Link about how you're going to be impacted, that if you are within five kilometres of this corridor that you should be making contact with them to ask how you're going to be impacted. Um, we've had um, reports to community liaison group members. I'm also a community liaison group member uh, for the new implementation community liaison group. Um, Similarly to Michelle, my experience is that it's very much uh, a box ticking exercise that NELP need to demonstrate that they have one. Um, and that's all they're really interested in is that they actually have a CLG. They don't really care whether it's effective or not. Um, we've raised, Michelle and I have both raised um, repeated concerns about the impacts of community, on community rather, and the lack of notification to community. And this continues to be an ongoing issue. Um, that we haven't been able to, to achieve a resolution on. Um, there's a clear lack of escalation points for dispute resolution for residents. Uh, for example, um, regarding the noise impacts, um, when we raise these directly with the contractor, um, the contractor tells us, thank you for your patience. When we raise these complaints with North East Link Project, they tell us to go back to the contractor because we need to resolve it with the contractor. When we call uh, the big build number, which is what we're supposed to be doing, um, they tell us that they don't have any notification of the works and that they only have a phone number for the contractor, so they can call the contractor who doesn't then answer. And uh, you, you keep going round and round. So um, we've requested um, measures such as noise attenuation to be explored because we are so close to the project and actually disrupting uh, our family to move during a stage four restrictions in a pandemic is not ideal. Uh, and North East Link have refused noise attenuation measures and they have cited that the reason 
that they won't provide it is because it sets a precedent and then everybody would be eligible for it and the government can't afford it. But um, they had said that we could have noise cancelling headphones. And I've said to them, well, if you can tell me how to homeschool three kids and work full time with noise cancelling headphones, I'll take them. But otherwise, um, you can probably keep them. So that's um, my experience so far. Um, I've been working pretty hard with the local community in the lead up to the environment effects statement process to educate people on the opportunity to make submissions to that process. And I'd like to think that we were really effective in um, contributing to the really high number uh, and, and high level of engagement from the community during that process. There were 880 submitters. Um, a lot of them were lay people like me from, from the community who were worried about the impacts. Um, I ran two community meetings that were fairly well attended. We had about, um, I would say, 300 to 400 people that we reached in total. Um, it's a bit hard to do that at the moment under stage four restrictions, but I think it's that kind of community action and network that we're going to need um, to, to resolve the issues and actually push back to get better outcomes for community on this. And I think I'll, uh, I'll probably leave it there for now. Awesome, thank you so much, Katie. And so sorry, I did not, I wasn't able to properly introduce you, but I think you did a very good job of doing it yourself. Um, just reminding everyone that um, thank you for being patient with us because we've had a lot of technical issues tonight, including lots of power outages, and I've stepped in to be MC at the last minute. So thanks for your um, understanding. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for sharing that with us, Katie. It's just horrific the way that you're being treated by the North East Link project. And I really hope we can get some justice. Um, so now I will pass on to our next speaker. Um, but before that, I'll just quickly um, let people know that um, if you are enjoying tonight's event, we are um, a, a grassroots organization and um, we will have a tip jar um, posted in the comments if you'd like to make a donation that will help us keep our campaigns going. And um, we also have just recently in the last couple of days launched a petition. Um, so that will also be in the chat box that you can sign, um, a petition to rethink the North East Link. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for your questions so far. Keep um, posting those in the chat, that would be awesome. So now I'll hand over to James. James, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, James is the Vice President of Warringal Conservation Society and a local resident who will be speaking on some local environmental impacts tonight. So I think James, you'll be um, sharing your screen with us for a bit of a um, slideshow. So I'll pass it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. If I can just get, yeah, if I can just get my screen up now. Um, how does everyone, what, what can you see at the moment? So you've got it pressed um, at the bottom right hand. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. My business. So hopefully you can see my screen now. Yes, yeah, so just, uh, I'm, I've lived in the area for 15 years. I live near the Simpson Army Barracks. I know that area well, um, which is going to be heavily impacted. And, and I've been involved with the Wrinkle Conservation Society for um, nearly as long as I've lived here. And so we've followed the project closely, um, put in, um, taken a concern in some of the impacts along the way, gone along to the um, EES or the Environmental in, um, Effects Statement and, um, and seen a lot of how the, the project has, has played out there and the responses to some of the issues. So I'm just going to take you it's very complicated and of course there's a lot involved but i'll just take you through some of the the, the major ones and talk about um, the problems and how they're being dealt with or not dealt with at the moment so one of the big ones that's been talked about is the loss of trees and the the 26 000, uh trees um figure has been thrown around a lot and um in the arboriculture report that refers to amenity trees. So they're trees that are roadside trees, trees planted in parks. Um, 
but they also have a, an ecological value too. I mean, they're used by wildlife and um, contribute to the overall sort of green habitat. Um, Banyal and Manningham and connect up with the uh, Yarra River Corridor. Also, there's a lot of uh, remnant bushland areas that, that are affected that are in addition to those 36,000 trees. Uh, and there's uh, in the order of 180 large trees. And when I talk about large, meaning greater than 80 centimetres uh, trunk diameter, which is a, a pretty big old tree, mostly red gums. And a lot of those uh, have really nice hollows, which are, so they're really good um, habitat for wildlife um, and quite old trees. Um, so losing them is a, a, a really big impact on the um, habitat for wildlife in the area and because of their age they're of course very hard to uh, replace. There's also thousands of smaller indigenous trees and when you talk about a tree that's less than 80 centimetres trunk diameter by most people's standards that's still a large tree and so if you look at sort of the the trees that we would still consider considerable sized trees that just gets lumped in there along with the native as in sort of general native vegetation there's still thousands of trees that will be lost and if you count the smaller trees which are the next upcoming generation of um, of uh, indigenous trees in the area, you've probably got tens of thousands in the uh, Simpson Barracks area that's being affected in, a, in, in itself. So it's a major lo loss of tree cover habitat. Um, there is a program to replace trees, but we're talking about replacing established trees with trees that'll take a long while to grow. And we're looking at hundreds of years before you get see the like of some of the uh, larger trees in Simpson Barracks or the one in um, the Caltex service station, the big red gum there. You, you know, you need to wait 500 years for something like that to grow. So uh, they're really, uh, in, in effect, irreplaceable. Most of the trees that will be lost are red gums and yellow gums, you know, nice habitat, but relatively um, common species. But the Studley Park gum is a, a quite a rare tree that's also going to be very heavily impacted by the uh, clearing for the northeast link. It's a rare natural hybrid of the river red gum and the swamp gum. It is thought to predate European um, colonisation, so it's not a quirk of, you know, the, of, of, of um, Europeans changing the, the, the environment. It's something that occupies a, an area where the parental species overlap and the habitat's right. And the only really good area that remains for the Studley Park gum, uh, where there's a, a viable population that's going to continue in the long term, is the Simpson Barracks, uh, the western border of that, which is unfortunately going to be heavily impacted by the uh, trench construction for the uh, the cut and cover part of the uh, Northeast Link project. So that population there, which is reproducing as long-term uh, population um, that, that's going to stick, that, that would stick around is going to be mostly eliminated and it's probably not going to, and so it's probably going to mean that it's no longer viable. And the response to that has been that uh, seeds will be gathered and, and planted at a, a site that's yet to be determined. Um, but that doesn't really compensate uh, for the loss of a unique sort of hybrid swarm that's growing there. So it's something quite unique and the trees that will be planted will be in, in, in another area somewhere along the river corridor and they'll be more of a, rather than perpetuating this population, they'll be a bit of a memorial to um, something that was in the Simpson barracks really. There's also some uh, smaller plants that are, that are quite significant. The matted black lily is a, a federally recognised endangered species because there's only in the order of a couple of thousands of these uh, left and they mostly grow in Victoria. And it turns out the Simpson's barracks, the Simpson barracks is uh, some of the best known habitat for matted black lily, um, particularly along the creek line area that will be heavily infected by the, uh, the, the the, the trench that's um, going to be dug for the, for the road along there. There's 83 plants within the project area and there's another 12 that are along the roadside elsewhere in the project in the project that'll, uh, that that habitat will, will, will be lost. Um, the um, 
response to this or the or, or the solution um, that the North East Link project have had is that these um, plants will be um, dug up or tr and translocated to another site. So this is quite a risky strategy when you're dealing with an endangered species like the matted flax lily. It has been done in the past past decades um, because they uh, have a rhizome and they can actually be dug up sort of very quite discreet and, and, and grown on and planted elsewhere. But what's emerged over the last um, couple of decades of doing this is that they don't do well when you move them somewhere else. The plants don't grow as fast. Um, they don't reproduce uh, as well. So the, the plan so far is to remove them, take them to a site that's as yet to be determined. So finding good habitat that replaces what's in the Simpson Barracks is going to be almost an impossible task. Look after them for 10 years and then wash your hands up with them and, and, and they're done. So when you're dealing with a, an endangered species and there's not many of it, it's, it's, it's a very, um, very risky strategy that doesn't ensure the long-term survival of this species. There's also some animals that are um, affected. Lots of animals are gonna be affected when you um, remove habitat like this. Um, but some of the notable ones uh, that, that, that are rarer and, 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 and in danger uh, uh, include the swift parrot. Um, so this is a, an interesting bird that's a, a migratory parrot that um, breeds up and spends the summer in Tasmania and then comes to the mainland um, to spend the winter. It's critically endangered because there's less than 2,000 birds thought to remain in the wild. And each winter we have um, a significant number of swift parrots that come and spend the winter, or at least part of the winter in uh, Banyol and the surrounding area because of the habitat that, that, that's here. They don't always come to the same spot because they need a choice of habitat. Um, seasonal flowering variation and, and lerps, which are the, the house of an insect that, that they eat. Um, as you can see in this example of one, eating a lerp off a, uh, a red gum near, um, uh, that's near McLeod Station. Um, but they need a, a choice of habitat to, um, to accommodate that seasonal variation that you get in food. Some trees might flower well one year, but not so much the next year. There might be lurk outbreaks in particular spots, and the swift parrots will hone in that and and, um, and 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 stick around for a couple of weeks while they um and, and feed up. So the argument has been during this process: if you take away a few trees here, like at the Simpson Barracks, you know that the parrots can always go somewhere else. So each of these impacts in itself is not considered significant. But then when you put them all together, the cumulative impact of continually losing trees becomes really important, important. So it's the death by a thousand cuts sort of thing that's really having a very heavy impact on this the swift parrot and that's why it's such a, a bind because of what's happening in Tasmania and also um, in its winter habitat here. And the last notable species I'll talk about is the, 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 the powerful owl. So it's a, a, an amazing bird, um, biggest owl in Australia threatened species, it's an apex predator that feeds on possums. It needs a big territory, it's a big bird. It eats a lot of possums and when it's breeding um, young, they, they, have, they start from about the size of a chicken egg and they grow up to a, a, a bird that um, stands about 60 centimetres tall very quickly. So you need a, a large healthy area of habitat to supply possums, uh, brush tails, uh, ring tail possums, sugar gliders, and, um, <clears throat> and, the, and it takes the occasional bird and, uh, and flying fox. But there are powerful owls that are, um, exist in the, pros, the, 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 um, the project area. They've been around for many years. There's at least one breeding pair um, that have a habitat that is going to be affected. The southern end, um, the tunnel entrance area um, around the Heidi, where there's going to be work there for a big interchange as well. Um, that's part. That's the southern part of their territory. They range up as far as north as the Simpson Barracks. And I've just talked about the Simpson Barracks, the loss of habitat that's going to occur there. So that's either the northern and southern extent of their, their habitat there that they're going to lose part of. And also recently, this, this wasn't something that was discussed at the, um, the, the environmental effects statement hearing, 
but it's a predictable outcome. Sporting clubs have been displaced. They're looking for new areas to go. So um, to keep everybody happy, North East Link Project has proposed uh, soccer fields on the river flats at, um, along Temple Stowe Road. So uh, going closer than 100 metres to the river. And so this is in the heart of the powerful owls um, territory. It's an area where they spend a lot of time. They roost, they've raised young in the area and there's going to be soccer fields abutting that area with lights and increased traffic and, and, and no noise and so on. So this project is really going to uh, uh, affect the, the ability or the, the likelihood that um, the, the area is a viable um, habitat for the powerful owl. And these um, lower sort of suburban areas are becoming more important because uh, about 30 percent of the powerful house habitat was uh, destroyed in the recent summer bushfires so you know there's, there's a lot there's a lot more there's, a, there's plenty of other animals that are maybe not so endangered or threatened that are just nice to have around that we'll, that we'll go to so um all, all got to do with habitat and the uh, the how nice it is to have some of this habitat in in a otherwise suburban environment so just to summarise some of the major concerns that you know, we've seen along the way, a lot of the environmental assessments have been uh, fairly incomplete. But for example, the super parrot, parrot hasn't probably been considered only in a superficial way. The surveys for powerful owls, they, uh, in half a dozen surveys, the experts, I, they didn't see a powerful owl. So they're coming up with these plans based on a very poor understanding of, uh, of how um, how these species use the habitat. Where there has been more complete data, it's in the case of things like the matted flax lily or the Studley Park gum, and it's actually documenting what's going to be lost um, so that they can work out environmental offsets and stuff like that. So it's a pretty sad, sad state of affairs where you document things well just before you flatten them. The other hallmark of a lot of this uh, work has been the responses and the, the mitigate, mitigation strategies have really been um, inadequate. The matted flax lily um, re response, um, the, de the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning flagged that the outcomes for translocation are poor and that this is not really going to work, but it's all gone through anyway. So, um, so th there's does, there's, there's really no recognition that the, the, the mitigation strategies are, 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 don't really make up for what's being lost. And project-wide, the, the, the big sort of, um, the, the big problem has been that the engineering side of the project has been done uh, where environmental problems are flagged, there's a real reluctance to make any meaningful changes to the project to um, reduce the environmental damage. Um, and this is illustrated by the, the reluctance to endorse, it, you know, to, uh, to um, embrace a longer tunnel or, or the simplification of interchanges. And this was something that the committee that assessed this project recommended, not only for environmental reasons, but because of the social benefits as well. Um, so it appears that even though the whole process went through, there was never really any will to make changes to the project, which has been a really disappointing um, aspect of it. So um, there's a lot more to it, but that's just the summary uh, of it, and I'll, uh, I'll leave it there. Thanks for inviting me along. Thank you so much, James. Um, yeah, I think it's just... It's just horrific how much native flora and fauna is going to be destroyed by this toll road and just how the process has really let down the community and let down, um, yeah, the future of, of biodiversity in that area. Um, so thank you so much for sharing those insights. Um, there were some of those species that I wasn't aware of. So thank you. Um, just a reminder to everyone um, that we do have a tip jar that will be posted in the comments if you're enjoying tonight. Um, you can chuck a couple of dollars in there to help us keep doing our grassroots campaigning. Mm -hmm. And we'll also, we've will also we also just launched a um, petition, so you can sign on to that as well. Um, so we are running a little bit behind time at the moment, so I'll ask our next few speakers to um, be as succinct as possible. 
Um, but next I'd like to invite Barry Watson, who is a Doncaster resident, um, who's been researching and actively involved in road traffic noise and air quality issues for the past 30 years. He's also served as a community representative on freeway projects and he's an active member of the Sustainable Cities Collective. Um, so without further ado, Barry, I'll throw it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Claudia. Uh, I would like to talk about uh, air quality and road traffic noise pollution and the situation we're faced with, with what's been done to date. Uh, with air quality in Victoria, there's a state environment protection policy which defines limits for particle pollution and gases. These limits uh, are usually, uh, when there's a project proposed, these limits uh, are usually uh, modelled and uh, to show compliance with uh, when the project's built. Uh, the state environment, which I'll refer to as SEP from now on, um, a SEP was done for the vent stacks, for the tunnels, and the SEP showed compliance for uh, all, all pollutants. Uh, and this was done for, because they have to get a works approval. They can't get a works approval without showing compliance with SEP. But for the surface road, uh, you, you don't need a works approval. All you need is the minister's, planning minister's approval. And so it should have been done in the EES, but it wasn't. Um, table 85 in the EES predicts an increase of two and a half times the current PM10 and PM2.5 uh, fine particle pollution by the year 2036. Particle pollution is uh, caused by diesel fuel, tyre dust, brake dust and ordinary everyday dust. Um, studies show that in Australia, 1,700 deaths per year are caused by vehicle pollution versus 1,300 deaths from road accidents. If our government has seen fit to declare war on deaths caused by road accidents, why do they promote building roads in creek valleys that will increase deaths caused by vehicle pollution? The other thing to remember is that World Health say the only safe level of particle pollution is zero. City of Burundara engaged Mr Graham Lorimer of Biosphere to do a report on the existing air quality along the Eastern Freeway. He looked at the air quality at Bellevue Primary School in North Bourne, and his comment, comment was, if the particle pollution levels were much higher, he would be concerned. While Burundara, particle pollution will be two and a half times higher at Bellevue Primary School. So that's all I'll say on air quality. Uh, I'll move on to road traffic noise. In the EES, uh, they've adopted the 63 dBA limit for noise, which covers midnight to 6 a.m. And that applies to the ground floor window, not the upper level window. The, the EES determined that this criteria will be breached at 159 properties. And the reason why they're accepting uh, breaching their own limit is because it's going to cost them too much money to pull down existing noise walls and put up bigger noise walls. So Australia's largest infrastructure project is cheating on the standards, uh, they call it more cost effective. Uh, so that's the daytime. Then we have the nighttime noise. Uh, there is no nighttime noise study in Victoria, as I said. So in the EES, there were some scoping requirements which required the project to look at the World Health Organization 2009 Europe nighttime guidelines, uh, which state 40 dB for the nighttime, 40 decibels is the, the average hourly reading re limit. Uh, Mr. Wynne has ruled uh, 55 dBA uh, free field, which is free field is an oddball type of standard. No one in the world does that. And it, free field means that the noise will be measured six metres from the house instead of outside the window. Uh, 
Um, this is a woeful breach of the World Health 2009 and is well above New South Wales road noise policy limit of 50 dB for the night time period. In summary, oh, sorry, there's one other thing. Our planning minister, Mr. Wynne, in his assessment of uh, North East Link environmental effects, he said that we need, I'll read out what he actually says in his report. He says, a new policy should be developed to assist in decision-making for future projects. In the absence of any future, any further action from Department of Transport, it is perhaps advisable that such policy de development is undertaken by other agencies such as the EPA. I've written to both those agencies and they both refuse to do what Mr Wynne is instructing them to do. So in summary, uh, we need a proper state environment protection policy, SEP, impact study to be done for all the surface roads of the project. Uh, we need our councils to take action to comply with their own Public Health and Wellbeing Act on behalf of their communities. And we need the councils to force the Department of Transport and EPA to produce a nighttime noise policy. And we need NELP to do a nighttime noise impact study, which has not been done. I've asked NELP for traffic volumes, I get nothing back. So I don't know whether they don't know what the traffic volumes will be for the night time or whether they don't want to tell us. But these are the shortcomings to do with air quality and road traffic noise. And you can ask yourself the obvious question, why haven't they been done? And the answer is pretty simple. If you don't know about a problem, you don't have to solve it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barry. That was very comprehensive and um, I feel like you've really given it to us in a, in a way for people to understand and there's more information about that on, the, on our website at um, Friends of the Earth Melbourne slash Sustainable City. So thank you so much for that Barry and yeah it's just atrocious how, um, how many holes there are in the EES process and how much they haven't considered. So yeah, Barry's been working really hard on doing all of this research and trying to get it out there. So awesome work, thanks Barry. Um, next, I will pass it over to John Stone, who is a senior lecturer in urban planning at the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning at the University of Melbourne. And his research focuses on ways to achieve sustainable transport in Australian cities. This work shows that community advocacy is central to success or failure in, att in attempts to change urban transport systems. So I'll throw it over to you, John. Do you have any slides or are you just- No, going to... no, no. Okay. Awesome. And I'll be quite brief because I'm really wanting to pull together a lot of what people have already said. It's when you put it all together, you know, the, the impacts of this project are just so appalling that if you were going to go ahead with it, you would have to be sure that the benefits for the society as a whole were huge. You know, if we're losing swift parrots, powerful owl noises, Katie and all her uh, neighbours putting up with this for years and years and years. You have to know that this was a good thing to do. But uh, one of the things that I want to introduce at the start is just this idea of the inevitability, apparently, of the need to build big roads. Uh, cities have choices. We always have choices. At any point, we have a choice whether we're going to go ahead with something, even if we've started on the process, even if we've started pulling down ancient trees. And what the choices we have are, are really about, when you're thinking about transport projects, about the patterns of where we live and where we go. Those patterns that we enjoyed that we used, that we created around the city before we were locked down, they weren't inevitable. There's no particular reason why we had to make the city in the way we did. We've used our cars as much as we do because governments and developers have made those choices for us to build the city in a particular way that makes it 
necessary if you're going to take advantage of all the things the city offers. It's almost inevitable that you have to have a car and it doesn't have to be that way. So we can make different choices and we can make choices which get us towards a fairer and greener city, uh, the city that we might want to create after COVID. And the, the elements are there in, in many parts of government policy. Plan Melbourne itself articulates a vision of a city built around suburban centres with more of what we need closer to where we live. And the jargon for that at the moment is 20 minute cities. But, but there's many ways we've talked about that historically over, over decades. Uh, Freiburg, a city in Germany, calls this sort of policy the city of short distances. And that's what it's done, made it is its fundamental urban vision is that things that we need will be close together. So we can do that. And there's many examples around the world of how we do that. But if you want to do that, you have to make different transport choices to the ones that we're making. You have to have stronger cross town public transport networks. You have to have supporting this. You have to have the planning controls on where jobs and services are located. You have to move to get more freight on rail. And we've been actively moving in the other direction. There's a thing called the freight state, which is probably, if people say, is there a transport plan for Melbourne? Well, it's probably the documents called freight state and the freight plan. And if you look at that, it's basically to transform Melbourne into logistics and truck movements. And so it's not inevitable. It's something that people have set out to achieve. So if you want more of sprawl and dispersal of jobs, a growing disparity in wealth, an opportunity between people who live in the inner and people who live in the outer suburbs. If you want more and bigger trucks on the road, if you want more greenhouse emissions, then, then you'll build roads like the North East Link. But the problem we have is that people see that as necessary. How many of people, when you have your conversations with your neighbours in this corridor, they say, well, I know it's going to be awful, but we need it. And that's the fundamental difference between the communities there and the communities who successfully fought the East-West Link is they just said, no, we don't need this. And so we need to really build that sense that we don't need this project. In fact, all these costs that people have so eloquently described tonight, will pay those costs and we'll pay for it in a city that we, we don't want. So the North East Link never made sense. It makes even less sense in a COVID future. It makes absolutely no sense in a future which has to be carbon constrained. So if we're going to avoid bushfires, if we're going to avoid all the things that we want to avoid from you know, a city that, that is going to live with, with COVID, then we have to say no to North East Link, even at the stage where it is uh, at the moment, because COVID is going to accelerate our requirements to build the city of short distances. We're going to have to be able to build a city where we move around less. We're going to have to have open space in our neighbourhoods, not destroying it. You just know the pressure that Melbourne is under as we try and use our open space close to home and how inadequate that is. So, all these things mean we need to be putting the money that we would have put into this project into the things that build a city of short distances. And even if you were thinking of this as a COVID, post COVID job creation scheme, it wouldn't make sense. There's lower jobs than significantly the same dollars in public transport, and certainly fewer jobs than if you were putting that money into local improvements to transport networks, local roads, local uh, bike paths, local public transport. And uh, Ian's going to talk a little bit more about what the public transport network should be. But my research internationally over the last 15 years has shown conclusively that you can have better public transport in the urban form that we have today. People will tell you we're not dense enough. That's just complete nonsense. If you look at cities around the world, they, they can start to build public transport 
within the urban form that we have today. It's just a matter of will, a matter of political organisation. So really, I just want to conclude by saying it's really clear that there is absolutely no reason to build this road. There's all the costs we've talked about and it makes our transport problems even worse. It doesn't solve them. It doesn't do what everybody's sort of hoping that it will. It'll give them freedom to move around the city. It won't do that. It'll just displace um, congestion to other parts of the city and force us to, to build the East-West Link, force us back to those conflicts that we went through um, five, ten years ago. So really we have to take our leaf out of communities all around the world who faced really huge challenges and have worked together and found ways to build an opposition that can succeed. And that means we have to step outside the processes of ever expecting North East Link authority to do what we'd like them to do, to, to expect the EPA to, to protect our environment. All of these things I mean we have to step outside those structures because they're designed to keep us quiet, to keep us uh, engaged in, I mean, we need people like Barry doing that research, but the research on its own won't change things. It's telling our neighbours what that means and giving them opportunities to, to promote their opposition. So collective, non-violent, inventive strategies that take us out of the narrow political world in which we've so far been defeated to take this into to, to something which, which gets bigger. And that's why organisations like Friends of the Earth, organisations like the local groups that have worked so hard to, to, to put this project on the, the public agenda, they're absolutely vital that we, we strengthen those, that we take heart from uh, people around the world who have succeeded in face of huge odds. And really remember what people like Rebecca Solnit tell us that showing up is absolutely important. We don't know where that will take us, but if we don't show up, we we'll certainly won't get there. And so I really, it's fantastic that there's this many people here tonight, and I hope that it's the start of um, reinvigorating this campaign. So thanks very much. Thanks so much, John. It's been really great to have you summarise and kind of bring together all of the points that the other speakers have been making and really hone in on that message that it is about coming together as a community and, and pushing back and really poking holes in all of this, um, all of the kind of propaganda almost that the North East Link project has been um, pushing on to community members. So thank you so much for joining us today. And finally, um, I'll introduce Ian, um, but beforehand, I'll just remind people, we will hopefully have time for a couple of questions. Um, we'll see how we go. Um, but if you do have questions, post those in the chat. Um, and also, um, there is a petition and a tip jar if you're interested in signing to um, Stop the North East Link and also helping us continue to campaign by supporting us um, in the tip jar. That would be awesome, thank you. Um, so now I will pass it on to Ian Huntley. So Ian is a long-term resident of Borland North and a member and former committee member of the Public Transport Users Association, as well as a member of Protectors of Public Lands. Ian for many years has taken seriously the threat posed to urban life and the natural environment by the North East Link project and the heavy costs it would impose on all of us if, we, if, it were to go to if it were to go ahead. Ian is a committed campaigner against the project and a strong advocate for rational transport solutions in the project corridor and beyond. So Ian, thank you so much for joining us and I'll pass it over to you. Um, Ian, you're just muted. Thank you very much, Claudia. And thank you very much, Claudia, and good evening, everyone. Um, I suppose I could summarise the situation we find ourselves in by saying that most of the things that upset us about this project is including vegetation loss, um, loss of open space, the suffocating close proximity of the project to homes, noise, air pollution, 
uh, due to the fact that the Andrews government seeks to build a freeway rather than permit sustainable transport modes to do the job as they should. Um, about 12 years ago on behalf of protectors of, sorry, about 12 years ago on behalf of Friends of Banyul, I drafted a submission to the Victorian government that proposed improvements to the route bus network centered on Banyul, but also relevant to the, to the surrounding municipalities, including the one that I live in, Burundara was then part of a Melbourne-wide review of route bus services by the, by the Brax Brumby governments. What we found, I think we already knew, that much of the route bus system was poor by, with infrequent services, um, last services that finished at seven o'clock at night, no weekend services, poor connections to rail services. And we got next to nothing out of the review from the Victorian government in those days. So the inevitable happened or continued to happen, which is that people preference car travel over public transport because it saves time. The roads remained and became increasingly clogged. Um, if we fast forward to today as a consequence of this, is where I live in North Borwen, um, I should be able to travel to Heidelberg in about 12 minutes by public transport on either Bulleen Road or Burke Road but there was no route bus service to Heidelberg on either of these major arterials. Instead, I may take a tram, a bus and a train if I go in one direction. The bus ceases at about 7.30 p.m. on weekdays and doesn't run on Sundays. Now, this story is replicated all over the North East Link Corridor. If you live near the Pines in East Doncaster, it will take you two hours to travel by something that's laughingly called a smart bus to Melbourne Airport. It takes two hours because the route is so circuitous. And the service only operates every 30 minutes on weekends. Um, last year, expert evidence that was presented to the NEL panel hearing, which a number of us have mentioned tonight, showed that it takes four times as long to travel by public transport than by car to La Trobe University from Box Hill Central because the public transport services are so poor. Now about 3,000 students and staff members travel to La Trobe every day from south of the Yarra. So it's any wonder that Bulleen Road and other arterials north south are being increasingly choked. In the reverse direction, it is little wonder that staff and students traveling to Deakin in Burwood and Swinburne in Glen Ferry from Banyul and further north would preference the car, even though it would individually cost them quite a lot more. Um, the same expert evidence that was given to the inquiry last year showed that many more people travel by public transport to the Monash Clayton campus, also in a suburban location and also without direct access to a rail service than do at La Trobe. And that is because the route bus services in the southeast, although not perfect, are far superior to the mediocre services provided in Banyul and in the north and northeast generally. Um, Rosanna Road was the linchpin for the government propaganda to support North East Link. It caters now, I understand, for about 50,000 vehicles per day. About 5% of them are trucks, according to Vic Roads. However, most, most of the um, road space is actually taken up by cars typically with one occupant, the driver. And this is extremely space inefficient. The trucks loom large in people's consciousness because they are so noisy and intrusive. And on a road like Rosanna Road, dangerous because it isn't fit for purpose for heavy truck transport. So I think a crucial observation where roads capacity has been expanded by governments road conditions have in fact quickly deteriorated as a consequence over time. Uh, for example, when Eastlink was built, it was, it was paraded as, uh, as very beneficial to Springvale Road, that is it would get traffic off these major arterials. Um, and the same promise has been held out uh, for the, um, the North East Link project. But the reality is that rather than 
link major activity centres in the project corridor by sustainable transport modes, as has been sort of notionally proposed from time to time over the last 30 years, what the Victorian government proposes to do here is to basically make the major links uh, by the private motor car. And this is what is basically going to be our undoing unless we can turn it around. So thanks very much for the opportunity to speak. I'd be happy to take some questions as well. Awesome, thank you so much, Ian. I think it's really important that we cover the transport issues in the area because it's obviously an area that's really lacking so much. And um, I know I'm pretty sure it's Manningham is the only council that doesn't have um, a train or tram. So yeah, it's, it's really frustrating that $16 billion is getting thrown into a major toll road that we don't want. Um, so thank you so much for, for that presentation, Ian. So we've got about 13 minutes left. Um, so we might try and cover a couple of questions. Um, but before that, I'll just quickly let people know um, that if you do want to get involved, we have Sustainable Cities has weekly meetings on a Monday night and Moretta will post in the chat um, how you can get in contact with both Friends of Banyul and Sustainable Cities to get involved. And um, a good way to get involved as well is to um, follow us on Facebook, which will also be posted in the chat. And um, you can always send us a direct message on Facebook as well. Um, awesome, thank you so much. So um, let's have a look. There's a lot of fantastic questions. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, I might start with um, maybe to um, so maybe Jill, would you like to um, to read out your question? Um, you can turn on your your video and microphone if you like. Okay. Um, it was just a question about financing, given that I think the Liberals uh, refused to give the Labor, the Victorian Labor government, the funding for anything alternative to the East-West Link. I just had a bit of a memory from uh, the federal uh, Libs coalition uh, refusing to provide that money. So just wondering how it's to be financed. Um, would any of the panellists like to answer that question? Michelle or Ian or Barry? Barry? Yeah, I'm aware that um, the Feds donated 60 million to the early works or, or they, they donate, no, sorry, it might have been, um, yeah, the, the federal government did donate a lot of money to get the early works that are happening now up and going. Um, I can't remember the amount, but, uh, and I think um, they did donate uh, um, money a while back for North East Link project. Uh, but yeah, I can't remember the exact figures. Great, thank you, Barry. Um, so for Michelle, um, John Marori, you had a question about, um, is it part of the BRI memorandum? Um, would you like to um, expand on that question? Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, it's been uh, it's very topical at the moment that the Belt and Rose Initiative uh, by, um, by China, um, well, there was a memorandum of understanding signed with, um, the, uh, and, with uh, Andrew's government. And uh, in itself, it might be uh, a good, might, I have got no information about the details of it. But I just wondered whether it might be... Uh, behind the uh, money required for the Northeast Link. And um, I'm just asking the question. Cool, thanks, John. Would any of our speakers like to answer that question? Ian? i just make the observation that the Commonwealth Government is uh, apparently moving on bilateral arrangements uh, between overseas governments and subnational governments in Australia and indeed universities and other institutions that they 
might regard as being um, against the national interest. And uh, there's a little bit of media on that tonight, which I haven't caught up with completely, but might indeed be relevant to the fact that um, well, the future prospects for the um, arrangements that the uh, state of Victoria has entered into with uh, the Chinese People's Republic. It might soon come to an end. Thanks, Ian. Um, and the next question is um, possibly for um, Katie um, or maybe even Michelle. But um, Robert, would you like to read out your question about the local MPs and what they have to say? If you're around? Perhaps not. So the question is from Robert. Um, it says, what does your local MP have to say about what you have been through? Yeah, I can take that one if you like. Um, so Anthony Carbines is my local MP. Um, we have a very strange relationship, as you can imagine, um, when he does actually get back to me. Often um, it's a struggle to actually get a response from his office. Um, there was one... Um, uh, one instance early this year where um, he actually had told a journalist that I had his direct number and that was just not the case after the journalist started to put a bit of pressure on. So that was a bit of an interesting um, illustration, I suppose, for people if if you want a bit of insight into how that goes. But I've been in um, uh, Mr Carbine's office and I've spoken with his staff as they, they have seen me in... Um, uh, quite a heightened manner, manner of distress as we were finding out that we weren't likely to be able to remain living in our home anymore. Um, and the the best that um, his office has offered to do was to talk to uh, James Molino as the education minister to try to negotiate that our children wouldn't be pushed out of their um, schools if we were forced to relocate from the zone. Um, and those discussions started about eight or nine months ago and I still don't have a response. Thanks, oh, um, I, I, just yeah. saw an, I just saw a comment um, suggesting that I perhaps invite Mr Carbines to my house. I went better, one better than that um, and I offered to do a house swap with him because I think that if anyone thinks that it's going to be um, an appropriate and reasonable circumstance for a family to be living through this, um, I would most definitely like them to take me up on my house swap offer. Thanks, Katie. That's very, very smart. I like that. Um, this one could be for Michelle. Um, Jane Brownrigg, would you like to read out your question? Okay, I'll read it out. Um, oh, Jane, um, your question about the councils dropping the court case, would you like to read that out? Um, yeah, there were three councils who were... Could, could you talk a bit louder? Maybe if you just read it, please. Okay, I'll read it, no worries. Um, so how, um, why did the three councils drop their court case and opposition? Michelle, would you like to respond to this? Oh, sorry, I didn't actually hear that, but uh, can you hear me? Yeah, uh, yeah, kind of. <laughs> oh, how about that? Yeah, that's better. Okay. Yeah. So I the question was, um, why did the three councils drop their court case? Okay, um, well, I just want to say I've got power now, so I'm mildly relieved. It just came back on. Um, I think the three counts, well, all four councils have dropped the court case. The first three probably bowed out because of um, they were bribed with um, complimentary projects. And they also um, had legal advice that they were unlikely to win and that we had had a earlier um, well recent decision regarding the Western Highway in Ararat that um, even if the EES, the Environmental Effects Statement process is substandard, that the Minister can choose to do what he likes. So that um, it doesn't matter 
what rubbish you put into an AES project. There's rubbish out and the minister accepts it. So Be because Michelle, it's, sorry, it's Jerry McLaughlin here, because it's a judicial review and it's the structure of the, uh, the terms of reference and the way that it's structured under the legislation. But the Western Highway Widening Group cores are likely to challenge that decision. And this could be an opportunity for your group to join forces because it, at heart, it's the substance of the EES legislation that's, uh, that's okay. at fault here. Yeah, well, I, I, thanks, Jerry. The, um, what, what the issue was with um, the AES here was that the AES process was at fault and that we were looking at a reference design. We weren't looking at a final design so that conditions, the environmental performance requirements were based on a project that hadn't even been designed. And, um, and I, I think the councils should have pursued it, but there was um, a, re a reluctance to do it because they um, they just you know didn't want to invest um, ratepayers' money. But I think it was the wrong decision. And I guess the other um, I was thinking something else, but it's uh, the other thing about it is we we don't even have a reference design, or we don't have a final design, and yet the early works have commenced. We already have tremendous damage occurring and clearing of land, disruption to homes, pollution of the um, waterways, because that's what my uh, previous slide was showing, that we've got creeks running the colour of clay. And we the early works have commenced and we're being locked into a substandard project. They haven't even waited for the final design to occur. So it's really... Um, you know, it's quite a bizarre pro process and what the residents have been calling for is a, um, if the road has to be built, that it's a road that doesn't cause as much pain and anguish to residents and it doesn't cause the terrible environmental damage. And that could easily be accommodated, but for some reason or other, the government is forging ahead, doing the damaging early works now that locks us into a substandard project. So but this this is where the opportunity is, and I think a few people have asked around what are the legal redress options. And if 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 you want to fight, if you've got your fight, if you've got enough fight spirit among the communities to fight this, and if you join forces with the legal teams from the Western Widening groups which are well advanced in their legal challenge exactly the same legislation exactly the same flawed uh, structure the way that the projects have been structured and you, you team up with other groups that are experiencing the same thing say as the Westgate Tunnel groups well, same thing they're also experiencing that project actually the tunneling hasn't even started yet they're going to experience exactly the same pm 2.5s um the worse in fact far worse the, the the surface level contaminants are far they they haven't even started the tunneling yet and then the the remedial remediation levels and the Thanks, toxicity Jerry. i think um we'll definitely get in contact with those groups thanks for raising that point i think that's really important there's so many groups all fighting the same fight. So I think it's really important that we, um, that we link up with them. And we have, we have been in touch with um, some of the Westgate Tunnel folks, but um, it's a good reminder to get back in touch with them and to reach out to the Western Highway groups as well. So thank you for that. So we are on nine o'clock. Um, I would love to do some more questions, but I think it's best to let everyone go home. I'll just quickly remind people um, how to get involved. So please do um, send an email to Friends of Banyul or Sustainable Cities, which will be posted in the chat. Um, follow us on Facebook um, and you can message us on Facebook as well. That will be posted as well. Um, and if you have enjoyed tonight, f um, feel free to throw a few coins in the tip jar, which will be a link in the chat. And don't forget to sign our petition as well. And I'll pass over to Michelle just very quickly um, to give a bit of a spruik for Friends of Banyul, but quickly I'll just actually say a big thank you um, to all of our speakers for tonight and everyone on who's been behind the scenes. I'm sorry to um, uh, to some of the panellists who we didn't get to ask questions, um, but your presentations were just absolutely fantastic and 
it'd be fantastic if we could collate all of those PowerPoint presentations because a few people in the chat have been wanting to read them. So maybe we can um, make them available for the public. Um, but I'll just quickly throw over to Michelle um, to talk about Friends of Annual very quickly before we head off. I hope you can hear me, I'll yell, which is a bit awkward. Um, yeah, I'm president of Friends of Banyul. If we also would be looking for support, we're working um, very hard with Friends of the Earth and Sustainable Cities Group. And if you would like to contact us, you can email friendsofbanyul at gmail.com. And um, you can also uh, find us, we're very active on Facebook. So you can contact us on that. And, um, and thank you very much for the opportunity, Claudia. And thank you to Friends of the Earth for organising this and, um, you know, battling the, um, the elements tonight. So, and also I'd really love to thank everybody ha that has joined this um, Zoom meeting. It's fabulous to have your interest and support. And we want to encourage you to keep going because we will keep fighting this project because it's just the wrong thing for Melbourne and it's the wrong thing for our area. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Good night. Thank you. If the speakers want to stay on as well, um, just to quickly debrief, that's very welcome. <laughs>